if I had my way, everything would be so nice. This world would be like Paris. No, it would be a paradise. No one would ever have to say, I'm going to get my wish someday. All one would have to do is say, this is my order, if you may. Welcome to another episode of The School Without Walls. I'm founding host, Dr. Anthony O. Hobbs. And uh, we are pre-recording this program for Black History Month, which will be in February 2016. Today is January 1, January the 14th, 2016. Uh, today I'm introducing an African-American role model. Uh, this will be more or less contemporary, quite contemporary history. Uh, because he's yet alive. This is Coach Al Nor Northington. Uh, so, uh, Coach Nor Northington, glad to have you here. I Thank understand you. you were born in Kentucky, wasn't Louisville, it? Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky. So, tell us a little bit about your early life, if you will. Okay. The type of school you grew up in, so forth. Okay. I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, mm -hmm. and uh, I never remember my mom and dad being together, but. I stayed with my grandmother for my first early years of my life, and then in the second grade, my mother had uh, two other, I had two other brothers. Uh, my mother had three sons. We moved to Flint, Michigan, hmm. and that's where I got- You and your mother or grandmother? My mother, my grandmother was here in Louisville. Hmm. She kept us until my mother went to Michigan, hmm. got a job and sent for us, hmm. and uh, we moved with my mother when I was in the uh, second grade. And that's where we got our education. Flint, Michigan. Flint, Michigan. I see. Right, and I graduated from Eastern Michigan, so I spent most of my uh, education time and college time in Michigan. Which college did you graduate from? Eastern from? Michigan University. In Eastern Michigan University. Right. I believe that's where Rodney Slater graduated from. I know a Slater. Rodney Slater. I know a Ernie Slater, Slater from, I used mm -hmm. to work at the Girls and Boys Club in Ypsilanti, mm -hmm. Michigan, and right. one of my uh, program director's name was Ernie Slater. Rodney was working with President Clinton as the, uh, what they call it, the transportation? Yeah, I've, what, what I've they seen call that? The uh, transportation, transportation secretary. secretary. Right. I believe he had a scholarship there and played football. He's from Arkansas. He went to Louis well, Little Rock Central, went, didn't he? No, no, he was Marianna, Arkansas. Oh, Marietta, Arkansas. He graduated okay. Marianna, Arkansas. Okay, I've, I've seen I'm Rodney Slater. Through. Okay, go on. You graduated there, and did you go into education right away, or did you do something else? Well, that? while I was in college, I was the first person in my family to go to college, so okay, that was a kind of a right surprise. There. My Even my high school was shocked when I got my master's degree and came back home, went back to my high school to teach, and they said, get out of this building. What you doing in here? <laughs> and I told them, I said, man, I come here to be a substitute teacher, and they didn't believe it because mm -hmm. They weren't expecting me to make nothing out of myself. Okay. A lot of what happens to us in history, people don't have high expectations mm -hmm. of us. They expected me to work in General Motors and that mm -hmm. would be it. But I never, I did work in General Motors for nine months, but that motivated me to go to college more. You had a vision. I had a vision. Better. I always wanted to be a coach. Mm -hmm. And when I was in the seventh grade, I was a great athlete starting from the sixth grade all, all the way through. I was the smallest one. Always the shortest one in class, smallest one on the football team, baseball team, basketball team, but I always was captain. What position did you play I in football? Played, in football, I played quarterback and linebacker. In, in high school? In high school, 115 pounds as a junior, and I was starting as linebacker. My and God. I played a lot, and we played in the major class A section of Michigan piece of football. leather well put together. Right. I had a lot of heart and a lot of determination and that's why I'm standing that, where I'm at that now. That should be encouraging for the smaller men right. today. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Don't let that stop you. My uh, seventh grade coach told me, uh, Mr. Zupko, he said, you're going to be a great coach one day. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand what he was saying, mm -hmm. but I was, it was at an early age you could tell I was going to do something athletic, going to be a coach or mm -hmm. teach and um, you know, because I and I love sports. What I is want, your master's in? In physical education. I see. Yeah, physical did education. Did you do that at the same school you got your bachelor's, or did you go to another? I school? stayed at Eastern Michigan. What well, a good point! I uh, worked at the Girls and Boys Club of Ypsilanti, Michigan, mm -hmm. and that was one of the best jobs I ever had to prepare me as far as I got a chance to work with a lot of people. I got a chance to do a lot of coaching. Mm -hmm. I coach kids now that I look on TV and see people on TV, even in Flint, Michigan. Mm -hmm. I looked at a congressman on Flint, 
at Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. and I used to be his supervisor at Wayless Children's Center. Now he's a congressman. What is his name? Dan Kildy. Is that and right? I used to be his supervisor at Whaley's Children's Center. Mm. And then I'm always looking on TV. I was looking at a Super Bowl one game, mm. and uh, Andre Risen, he was my 12 and under third baseman, mm. and he played with the Green Bay Packers, and he scored a touchdown, and I, I really got excited about that. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've touched a lot of young people in my life, and I, that's what I wanted to do. Well, I wanted that's to wonderful. Coach. So right. in your, in, in your uh, professional career, you... You've, you worked where? Now, let's, let's do that. You worked where as an adult first? Okay, I started off in Flint, Michigan as a uh, teacher and a coach, okay. substitute, teacher. substitute teacher. I started off making like $35 a day substitute teaching mm -hmm. in Flint, Michigan. Right. That was back in 76. Then you moved and, on? And now I went to, um, I worked at Whaley's Children's Center because I couldn't find a full-time, but I, I was a supervisor at Whaley's Children's Center. And I met a Dr. Norman Powell out of Washington, D.C. He was the president I was in Toledo, Ohio at a conference, and he was the president of the National Child Care Association. And he offered me a job just over lunch. He offered me a job in Washington, D.C., and uh, more salary than I had ever had. So I went to D.C., I ran a group homes, shelter homes, hmm. and ended up working for the D.C. government. Is that and, right? And uh, stayed in Washington. Who was the mayor at that time? Uh, mayor. Uh, was it this black mayor? Yeah, the one that uh, uh, just recently died. Uh, Barry. Mayor and Barry, Mayor yeah, Mayor. Mayor. I met him in person. I see, he yeah, was there for a long time. He was the mayor for life, that's what they say. They, they called him that, didn't we? Yeah, we have about one more minute. What else did you do after that? Um, I was in D.C. and then I, I met my wife, I got married, mm -hmm. and uh, we moved to Louisville, Kentucky. We bought a house in Kentucky. Went back to your first place. First place, because I had an older brother stand there and he helped me out tremendously. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting a teaching job in Louisville, Kentucky, mm -hmm. and that's gonna be the start of you know what led me to being a Hall of Fame basketball coach. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, I worked at uh, Home of the Innocents, which is working with neglected and abused children on the weekends. I see. And I always I worked at you know working you with young that people. Kind of work I like that. No. Well, let's stop on that note for the uh, break, and we'll be I'm back sorry. in just a few minutes. Okay. The 60th Annual Rural Life Conference is scheduled for Friday, March 4th at the Isaac S. Hathaway at John M. Howard Fine Arts Center on the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff Campus. Registration begins at 7.30 a.m. with the opening session at 8.45. This year's conference theme is Sustainable, Healthy, and Profitable Rural Development. Sponsored by the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff School of Agriculture, Fisheries, and Human Sciences, the conference features several theme-related workshops. Pre-registration is requested of everyone, even though the conference is free to producers, homemakers, and retirees. The cost for professional and agency personnel is $50. After February 19th, late registration will cost $75. To pre-register or for more information, call 870-575-8968. That's 870-575-8968. Start a story. Adopt at theshelterpetproject.org. I'm doing a downward dog and he's underneath. He's, he's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. I love Toast because she's a lazy diva. Toast does whatever she wants, obviously. You've messed up your son's haircut. Mm, Mom? Do you A, try to fix it? Like it never happened. B, Work with what you got. Or C, show solidarity. Thank you, baby. As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. Those of you who have just joined us, I'm Dr. Anthony Hobbs, host of this educational program called The School Without Walls. My guest today is Coach Al Northington, who has given us uh, success story. We are modeling a successful African-American. This is contemporary history, although this will be the third episode of our February Black History Program. Uh, Coach, you were telling us about your job at your birth home. Louisville, you, Kentucky. Louisville, Kentucky. Okay, my first job coaching and teaching was at Central High School, same school Muhammad Ali 
and I thank God I got a chance to talk to Muhammad Ali several times. Mm. We were, uh, I was coaching the boys at the time and we were getting ready to go to the regional championship and Muhammad Ali called, gave me a phone call. Mm -hmm. And then on another occasion, I saw him a couple other occasions. Mm -hmm. I saw him at a concert and also he came at my job at Home of the Innocence. He came there to visit the children. What was his status in boxing at that time? Oh, he had retired. He had, oh, he, he had, had retired. Older. Okay. He, yeah, he was retired. He, he was he sickly. Had retired. Okay. Yeah, he had gotten ill, and mm -hmm. but he, he was still, still had that personality. I got you. Yeah, still okay. got that good personality. So I taught at Central High School, and then I left Central High School, and I ended up taking a job that I turned down two times. They asked me to coach a girls team, mm -hmm. and I had really hadn't coached girls before so I wasn't really interested at first mm -hmm. and then I watched the girls practice one day an all-star girls team out of Kentucky they were practicing getting ready for an all-star game in the summer I was teaching summer school mm -hmm. at Iroquois High School and the athletic director came up to me again and said man I sure would like for you to coach my girls I took the, I ended up going and taking the job I did not know that the team hadn't won a game in four years oh my god and uh, I was one of the biggest challenges I ever had in my life mm -hmm. and people laughed at me and they laughed and we first got started it was like a pyramid every year I coached them we got better mm -hmm. and uh, ten years later we was the number one team in the state we actually won the state championship with a record of 33 and 1 mm -hmm. but I don't know how many times people told me man get out of this school they'll, they'll never win 20 games mm -hmm. they'll never be champions or they'll never be but I never listened to that mm -hmm. I've always had a positive attitude thankful that I got involved in you know positive uh, attitude and mm -hmm. working with positive reading a lot of positive people and mm -hmm. you know doing those things to educate myself but I worked extremely hard at Iroquois High School they had a projects in Louisville called Iroquois projects it's now closed down mm -hmm. it was one of the toughest projects in the state mm -hmm. and that's where I got most of my players from mm -hmm. and the team the school had never won a state championship uh, the kids were so undisciplined that nobody thought that anybody could get the kids to buy into a program to be disciplined mm -hmm. enough to win and I was able to buy get the girls to buy into listening mm -hmm. and we had study period every day before we practice and I brought in guest speakers and we just we turned the whole thinking process around I took the girls to Disney World and I mean people laughed at us we had to raise a lot of money to go to Disney World and they just didn't do inner city kids like that mm -hmm. that's why I'm, I'm interested in a curriculum now to where in the school systems, I think all the kids need to go on field trips. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in doing some work now to get curriculum where they take the kids to places like Memphis, Tennessee, Salma, Alabama, mm -hmm. Dallas, Texas, Washington, D.C., oh, yeah. which uh, the Martin Luther King mm -hmm. Memorial is just fantastic. Uh, we do have that going on in Jefferson County. We okay. Have, we have that already. All the just want to in encourage more of it. I don't know about all the schools. Uh, but I know we've had a lady at Pine Bluff who was interested in history. She's taken them to D.C. and different places. Oh, like good, that. good. Uh -huh. But it's, you can never uh, say too much about the importance of it. We have, I think, four districts here, so I don't know whether all four of them are doing that or oh, not. Okay. But it is a tradition right. in Arkansas to go on field trips. That's good. Yeah. And I hope, hope they do go to Washington, D.C., and right. I hope they get mm -hmm. to see the Martin Luther King memorial because that's really beautiful and you said you worked with those girls 10 years 10 years and when did you start winning you said they hadn't won and, well and the no first year we won four games and lost 20 something mm -hmm. and everybody was nice to me yeah, just, next year we won four you had improved i right? won coach of the year but we only won four games i said why did they give me coach of the year and we only won four games, but one of the referees said, man, before you came, them girls couldn't get the ball across the court. Mm -hmm. He said, you taught them the fundamentals, and you can just see it. And everybody was telling me, they said, your team's going to be a champion one day. Because I worked so hard mm -hmm. putting up motivational signs, fixed up the locker room. Me and the students, we painted the locker room. We changed the whole image. How did they do in that classwork after you got with them? Tough. It was tough. I mean, after, did you ever get them to Oh, we improved improve a lot. Them? I got a player that got a full ride scholarship to the University of Kentucky. She got, matter of fact, the L.A. Sparks called me when they drafted her. Mm -hmm. She was drafted number 10. I don't know what draft it was, but. What year was that? Um, it was around 2000, and she graduated in 2009. I think it was in maybe two, she graduated from University of Kentucky four years later, about 2013. I see. When did you Recent. retire from? I retired in 2011. Mm -hmm. Did you yeah. retire from that school teaching the girls or did you from, do something after I, that? I taught 
at other schools, I didn't have the success I had at that one particular school again. Mm -hmm. And then I, I had gotten sick and I got reti retired. Mm -hmm. And I haven't coached. I've been in a lot of basketball camps. I've been Did you take early retirement or you just retired? Early retirement. Because of and health? Because of health at that time. But That's now it. I'm actually ready to go back to work because I'm healthy oh, now. Okay, we have only one other, about eight, eight more minutes. What else did you want to tell us about your success? Okay, I, went, I was able to go to Alaska and, and go to, I was chosen because I won state championship, mm -hmm. chosen as a coach to go over to Alaska mm -hmm. and do some basketball counts with Jim Clemens. Mm -hmm. And now Jim Clemens. Basketball clinics? Basketball clinics. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we well, I actually done speeches too because I spoke at churches and did mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. But when I was in Alaska, that was a great experience. Mm -hmm. I was able to take my son, who's now in Belgium. He just left January eighth, going to Belgium. Mm -hmm. But I was able to take him Which to Alaska. Which city in Alaska? Uh, Fairbanks, and uh, it was one other city that I went to. We had to land in another city because the weather was so bad. And we got there mm -hmm. that we had to land away from Fairbanks, and I can't think of the name of the city at the time. A lot of snow was up there, wasn't it? Yeah, it was different. It mm -hmm. was different. It was very different. But I really enjoyed it. Let us stop on this note for the break and we'll be back for the final break in just a few minutes. Okay. When I was six, my days were spent playing basketball. When I was six, my dream was to make it to the NBA. When I was six, my mom had a stroke. I'm Paul George and I want you to spot a stroke fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke fast. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. It's a short drive from your neighborhood to your naturehood. To find a neighborhood park or green space near you, visit discovertheforest.org. Those of you who have just joined us, I'm Dr. Hobbs, host of this educational program called The School Without Walls. My guest is Coach Al Northington, one of the winningest coaches in Kentucky. All right. Coach, go ahead and tell us about some other notes you've made pertaining oh. to your experience. Okay, well, I want to mention a couple of people. Mm -hmm. A.C. Green of the L.A. Lakers, mm -hmm. and then I want to mention Jim Clemens. He coached uh, Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. Now, I was able to work with them. You mean in high school or college? No, uh, this is pros. In pros. Jim Clemens is a professional. He coached, he coached with the Chicago Bulls okay. and the L.A. Lakers. Good, gotcha. gotcha. And he's a great assistant coach, mm -hmm. and he's noteworthy to be, you know, mentioned for black history. Mm -hmm. And A.C. Green, he played the longest game, uh, straight playing consecutive games with the L.A. Lakers. He played back when Magic Johnson was playing mm -hmm. back in that time. Okay. But he's somebody that I, I would like for, you know, our young people to know about. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after, you know, a thing that I did when I was in Washington, D.C., I created a black history sports contest. And basically what I used to do, I'd use it for middle school kids, high school kids. But I think our kids, even when I was in middle school, I wrote an editorial about we need to know our history. They wouldn't teach us history in Michigan. Oh, they no would not way. teach us no okay. black history in Michigan. So I, I took it upon myself mm -hmm. as an athlete, and I, they were shocked when I wrote an editorial for the paper mm -hmm. that I said we need to have our black history more in our 
uh, programs. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I got a black history program. It's, it's questions like, you know, he scored 100 points in a basketball game in the NBA, Will Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. And these, these things that our children should know, they don't know. Mm -hmm. Who's the first black coach to win a national championship? John Thompson with Georgetown. Mm -hmm. He was the first black coach. He was the first black coach in Arkansas to win a national ch a championship. Nolan Richardson mm -hmm. with the University of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. These kind of things, when I was teaching, I was shocked that a lot of our young people now, they don't you know, know and they don't seem to really, you know, be that excited about it. Continue to some more. We want to get all you have there. Okay, you want to get more? Out. Okay. You have uh, some more? The first black coach in the, in the NBA, one of the greatest defensive players of all time, Bill Russell. Mm -hmm. Growing the greatest running backs in the history, number 32 for the Cleveland Browns, mm -hmm. Jim Brown. Mm -hmm. And uh, you got um, coach at Grambling State College for 57 years. 57 years, one of my idols, Eddie Robinson. Right. Uh, she had polio until she was nine years old. They thought she wasn't gonna be able to walk. Who she was that? Wilma Rudolph, she ended up wait, going. Wait, let's go back to Eddie Robinson. You moved in, I was thinking you said Eddie Robinson had the polio. Let's no. go back to Eddie Robinson. Okay, he Eddie was... Robinson coached at Gramlin for 57 right. straight years. Right. He and used to cut the grass, he used to right. do everything. And, and he sent more morals to from a, from histo historically black, black colleges, right. right? Now we go to Wilma. What was okay? Wilma? Now Wilma Rudolph had polio up until she was nine years old, mm -hmm. and uh, Wilma Rudolph ended up going to Tennessee State. She ended up winning three gold medals in the 1960 Olympics: the hundred yard dash, uh, the two hundred yard dash, and the, the winning the relay. And I still remember watching on TV mm -hmm. when the, they gave Wilma Rudolph the baton. She was way behind, mm -hmm. and she ran that girl down from Germany and passed her up and won the championship. And mm -hmm. I remember watching that back. Uh, Wilma Rudolph. Wilma Rudolph. What happened to her after track? Do you have any history of what she did after that? Well, she worked for the president of the United States. She, she worked, yeah, at, before she passed. She, mm -hmm. you know, she worked for the president of the United States in the fitness program. Yeah, I remember her in yeah. history. All right, what else you have? We and in the two Williams yeah. sisters, you can't go without oh, mentioning Serena and Venus Williams, mm -hmm. two sisters that's uh, dominating tennis. Mm -hmm. And then you had the Spinks brothers from Saint, East St. Louis. They boxed. They both were Olympic champions, and both of them held a heavyweight boxing championship that at one time. True. Let's stop on that. We okay. have about three more minutes. Do we run there? I have a, we have a few minutes. I want to close this out, Coach, with uh, something that I wrote. Okay. Food for the power of thinking. Uh, uh, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen in the community, I'd like for you to take this seriously and figure out what group of people I'm talking about. I said it's called a profile of a people. I found myself in a country where there were a strange race of people. They did not know where they came from. They did not know who they were, yet they were speaking of going to a city called Liberation. Some called the city Liberation, but still they had no plan, no real leaders. I noticed that there was a group that called themselves leaders, but so few were following them. As a matter of fact, there were lots of them who called themselves leaders, but in reality, there was no leader. They were all going in different directions looking for the city called Freedom. They had strange appearances. Some looked Oriental, some looked European, some looked Na Native American, and many were Negrotted or African Americans. One strange thing about them is that they called themselves by different names, although they said they were of the same race or family. I could not help but notice that none of the people they resembled in appearance acknowledged them as kin, except the Negro or the African-like group. But the strangest phenomena about this race was the fact that many of them thought they were white people who just happened to look differently, speak differently, and act differently. That was very strange to me. They could not understand why white people did not accept them. Of course, I see it very clearly. It was because they were not white people. They just did not know it. This was because of the slave mentality that they carried over from the colonial period, the Willie Litch syndrome. They did not know from where they had come since they did not know this, 
they did not know who they were. I investigated the Orientals. They did not think that they were white people. I talked with the Native Americans. They had no desire to be white because they knew their history. This was true with all ethnic groups except this group. Certainly, there was something among the group who had no, someone among the group who had no desire to be white because they knew their history. This group was a very healthy and intelligent group. However, they, they had problems with the mass because they did not understand them when they made it clear that they had nothing against a European being white. But they did not. But they did have problems with their people who were not European, who thought they were black white people. Thus ends this paper. Glad Thank to have you, you my brother. I'm glad to be here. Come Thank back you. Another time. I definitely would love to. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Okay.